For anyone who's looking to get into property, what sort of advice would you give them as a starting point? Be consistent, show up, and, and I guess be authentic. You know, it's not easy, it takes hard work. It's about that long-term growth. Like I said, it's not get rich quick. Your mindset and education are, I guess, the two foundations upon which success will be built. Hi, Kevin McDonald here and welcome to the Progressive Property Podcast. On this week's episode of the podcast, I'm joined by Stephen Kemp. Now, Stephen is based up in Bolton. He spent the last three and a half years building up a property portfolio. It consists of single let, buy to lets and HMOs. And I thought it'd be really helpful for you, the audience listening in, to learn about how you can build a property portfolio from scratch in the last few years and in the current environment, the current marketplace, and what sort of challenges, obstacles that you can hit and come across during your journey. So Stephen, thank you for coming in and joining us. No, thank you for having me, pleasure. So, so for those listening in, who is Stephen Kemp, I guess, and why, uh, you know, what were you doing pre-property? So what was life like? Uh, well, pre-property, we were probably more like uh, most people, to be fair, you know, you've got a job, you're getting a couple of holidays a year, and you're not really thinking too much about the future, pension, things like that. Um, and well, not entirely. I guess we thought about a pension to a certain extent in the sense that we bought one single let property yeah. back in 2016. And we kind of thought that come retirement, that would be the property that we would sell that would fund our pension. But obviously, that, right. uh, as we now know, is not enough. So the we, you and your, your wife, girlfriend, partner? Uh, fiance, naturally. Fiance. Yeah. Okay, cool. So. Um, both of you were working full-time jobs? Yep, both working full-time. She's a civil servant and I was owning and running my own barbershop. Okay, cool. So not really able to help me, I guess. For anyone on the podcast, I don't have any hair. I'm not going to give you any custom, so I can see why you needed to move out of the barber business because, yeah, hair is disappearing on as I get older. So <laughs> you you were bought your first buy to let. Most people, I guess the route most people do, which is they're thinking about buying that property, it's a pension. What made you then, what was the, the reason or the thought process that made you think, you know, this could be more than just a buy to let for a pension? Well, I guess to be fair, back in 2016, like I said, we bought that single let property and we thought that would be the pension. But we, at that point, I guess we thought we'd, we'd made it to a certain extent. We've got the pension sewn up, we'll carry on working our jobs and, you know, when we get to that point in life, we'll, we'll sell it. But what happened over the next couple of years is we actually started accumulating doodads, as I call them. Anybody that's familiar with Rich Dad, Poor Dad is familiar with uh, just building up a little bit of debt that's really linked to stuff, I guess, essentially stuff. So we got to a point where we realised that something needed to change because the trajectory of our life was actually, if anything, it was getting a little bit worse financially as opposed to better. So therefore, we looked at what we had around us and obviously property, the one that we'd had plus our own home, over the past few years had just trended up a little bit. So therefore we knew obviously there was something in property, hence us buying the first one, and it just started to indicate that there was something worth exploring a little bit more, right. hence why we then looked to get full time into property. Okay, so you met, you had that chat, you both on board, so Natalie as well, both on board with doing it? Yeah, absolutely. Right. And you decided to go all in, buy property, build a property portfolio. So what were the sort of first steps you took to do that? Well, the first steps were ultimately education because we believe, you know, mindset and education are the foundation for everything. So we, we looked around, found a training provider and we got in with them, got some, got some education, which helped us, I guess, create a bit of a blueprint as to how we could move forward. In particular, buy, refurbish, refinance, buy to lets, that was, that was our model. And in fact, the actual buy, refurbish, refinance part of the education that we got exposed to was actually able to help us look at the single let property that we had and actually look at how we could alleviate the, the doodads, the debt, yeah. and ultimately wipe our slate clean. Yes, we didn't have any money to necessarily invest in property, but at least we were starting from a, from a level playing field. And then, like I said, the buy, refurbish, refinance linked with that, the other piece of information we, we were exposed to was the OPM, which was the other people's money, that we could find a way to bring value to other people through our projects and therefore they would fund them for a fixed return. Yep. So that's that's literally how we started out in property. So for, for a lot of people looking to start and they think, you know what, I'm gonna get into property, they typically start, try to exchange time for money in a job, save up a deposit, and they can get the property done. Obviously you mentioned their OPM being, not opium, other people's money, OPM. Don't go near the opium. OPM, um, when you looked at other people's money, um, did you 
find it easy to raise money? What, what sort of steps did you take to go out in there and go, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm new to property, I want to build a portfolio, would you lend me your hard-earned money? How, it, I guess people watching this will go, it's not that simple. So what, what was the steps you took? Yeah, do you know, I'm glad you asked that question. I think, in theory, it is simple, however, it's not easy. And that's, that's linked to most things in life and, and property in particular. So one of the things we, we were aware of was the simple principles around if we could find a deal that stacked up to where it had a margin in that could service not only us but our investors, we would theoretically be able to find the money. But again, that's just the theory. You actually have to do the doing, you have to mm. take the action. So we, we'd never been on, um, what do you call it, social media. We'd never been on social media before or we had years and years and years ago, uh, back in the dark ages, but we got on social media and that's probably been one of the biggest sort of accelerators within our right. business, getting on social media, getting out there and telling people exactly what it is that you do, exactly what it is that you've got to offer. And we started attracting interest in our projects that way. And the type of people that invest into your projects, are they just, um, you know, friends, family, people that you, old school friends, or are they total strangers? Yeah, absolutely. It actually starts off with, with friends and family. Naturally, your friends and family are the people that like you or typically like you, know you, trust you from the off. So they'll be the people that will be the, be the early adopters. But then naturally, once you've built some credibility with those people, they're more than happy to tell other people. So you find you, you sort of tend to have a ripple effect. Then when you've actually done a few projects and people are seeing the consistency of content that you're putting out, the consistency of work that you're putting in and the results, then you, well, we've got a, an investor from Dubai I didn't think we would attract investment from overseas. A person that we'd never even met, never come face to face with, and they've only seen our content online. So I guess it starts small, starts grassroots, starts at home, but it certainly does ripple out from there. Um, if you had well, I tried to do property just with your income from your hairdressing business and your, and your partner as a civil servant, do you think you'd have scaled your business as quickly so quick? Absolutely not, absolutely not. There's nothing wrong with, I guess, saving deposit pots and, and doing that if that's what you want. But like I said, we were in a position in life where we wanted change and we mm. wanted it not necessarily quickly because property is not a get rich quick, but certainly quicker than it otherwise you know, could yeah. have taken us. So therefore, finding a way to add value to your investments through bringing other people on board and adding value to their lives mm. was, was, like I said, it was the catalyst and springboard for us growing the portfolio the way so we have. Over the last so about three and a half years investing now? Uh, well, like I said, we had the one back in 2016, took yep. a bit of a sabbatical. We knew we had to come back to property. So, yeah, I think we are, 2018 was a, a re real solid year of education for us. A lot of learning, a lot of networking, just literally filling, yep. filling our heads with the knowledge. And then the execution came with the first purchase at the beginning of 2019. 19. And then we had a global pandemic and we're now out of that and we're fast forward to sort of beginning of September, so as you listen to this, we're recording at September 22. So let's call that 19, 20, 20, three and a, three -ish and a bit years, I guess, take away a few months of 2019 at the start of the journey. So how many deals have you done in that period of time? In that period of time, we've done, I think it's about seven, something like that. I know we've done a handful of buy-to-lets, a couple of HMOs in that time. Right, so a couple of HMOs, five buy-to-lets, Add into the other buy to, buy to let from 2016. So you've got six buy to lets, two HMOs. Oh God, lost count. Um, I just yeah. know we're buying number 10 at the moment. Uh, that's so interesting because when I started my property investment journey and I meet somebody and they go, oh, I'm only, what number are we on now? And, and I'd be like, how do you not know how many properties you have? But you actually forget when you start doing projects. So, so you start number 10 at the moment. Yes. Okay. Um, the projects that you've got, the the cash flow, etc. A lot of people watching this will go, oh, well, you know, property, you mentioned the word get rich quick. Properties get rich quick. You can hear a lot on social media, people doing a deal a month or regular deals. To get that many properties in three and a bit years is phenomenal progress because an average investor does one deal or two deals in their lifetime. So for anyone who's looking to get into property and they're thinking, could they get to a 10th property deal within three and a half years? What sort of advice would you give them as the starting points? What sort of steps should they take? Wow, great question. Well, realistically, you have to be consistent. I guess I wouldn't hang your hat on 10, 10 property deals in that amount of time, but be consistent, show up, and, and I guess be authentic is, is the biggest one, especially if you're in a position like us where you work with other people's money. You need to be 
truthful, you need to be honest about what it is that you've got, what it is that you're, you're offering. And again, that comes to negotiation, it comes across the board. I think people can smell BS a mile off. So just turn up, be consistent, don't be afraid to let people know what it is that you do, what it is that you're offering, and, and all of those things. And I guess one thing a lot of people probably won't mention, but have fun along the way because like anything, to an extent, yes, this is, this is different because you can do the work once and you know, theoretically get paid forever, but enjoy it, enjoy the process because you, know, you hear a lot of people that have made multi-millions of pounds and they say, Do you know what, in some ways I don't want to lose the money, but I wouldn't mind winding the clock back because the best days were the early days. Yeah. And it's like, we remember times where we had pledges of investment money and then all of a sudden it fell out of bed through personal circumstances. Again, we had property deals going through and they fell out of bed. And if you kind of like hang your hat on every single one of those things, you're destined to just take the emotional roller coaster beyond that that it, that it is naturally anyway. Mm. So just try and have fun with it as well. If you're looking to start in property, if you're looking to scale your property investment, then there is a completely free report that you can download in the descriptions and the pinned comments that can help you get started on your property investment journey. Um, the type of deals you invest in, are they all in the same area? Are you invest in a small or big geographical area? Where? Yeah, well, we tried to stick to Bolton, first and foremost, because we, we'd done the numbers, we'd done the research, it works there. Yes, there are better areas, yes, there are worse areas, but it was, a, it was, a, it was on our doorstep, we know it. We've added the knowledge, this is where we're going to invest. So we start buying in Bolton, but as with anything, when you get your name out there and you know maybe a, mm. people have heard you say before, become the local property expert, the local property guy, you end up attracting things in your, in your periphery, in your satellite, I guess. Yeah. So we bought stuff in the surrounding towns as well. One of them being, we had to buy something, this is a funny one, we had to buy something over in Manchester in order to get the property that we wanted in Bolton because the investor, because they were a landlord, an older landlord looking to sell down and retiring, I think they'd over leveraged previously back in sort of 2007, 2008 times. So they were in a position where to sell the property that they needed to sell that we quite liked the look of in Bolton, it wasn't a deal. But the great thing is because they were an investor, they got it. They got it in principle that it needed to be a deal for us and a deal for them. So he presented this out of Norway. He said, look, you know, I've got a portfolio of properties. Why don't I sell you another one? And that way we'll give you a really good deal on that one and it will sweeten the deal. I know it sounds like I've gone off on a tangent here, but we ended up buying one in Manchester, one in Bolton so that we could get, and this is how we end up in the, the surrounding towns, so that we could get a deal across the two of them. So yeah, we've got stuff in Walked and stuff in uh, Radcliffe, stuff in Farnworth, yeah, okay. a few of the surrounding towns. And um, you obviously, single let, buy to lets and HMOs are your preferred sort of strategy. Was there any reason initially you went down that route rather than maybe the more creative, say, serviced accommodation or commercial conversion or something? I could give you a, a really eloquent answer that we wanted to uh, climb the, the property pyramid or the property triangle, whatever you refer to it as, and ultimately cut our teeth, learn as we go and you know scale up through the strategies. But if you want a completely honest answer, it was actually fear. When we first started out, we were, we were like, right, we, we know this is what we want to do, but we, we're cautious. Obviously, you've got to be cautious with other people's money anyway, but we, we're quite cautious as people. But on top of that, we were a little bit scared too. It was like, okay, what can we do that's not a million miles removed from what it is that we already do? We already had the single let let's do single let. And then before you know it, you know, you put an extra bathroom in, you put an extra bedroom in it, and you're thinking, you know what, this is not too much different to what a HMO might be. So okay, let's just put a few extra en suites in. And then you end up progressing through to the point where you now we're looking at commercial conversions and things like that. Okay, good plan. Um, the investors that work with you on deals, um, obviously they need to be paid back. This got, you've got to get them their money back, you've got to get interest back. And a lot of people look at this and they go, well, how do I get paid? How do I make money? Um, so wh where, where does this structure work that allows you to start to create your passive income from the properties as well as making sure the investor gets paid back? Yeah, great one. We always look at things long-term. Like I said, it's not get rich quick, it's, it's long-term. So we're working with people that have got money sat in the bank, it's, it's going to be there long term, you know, they're, they're risk averse, they love for somewhere to invest it, but you know, they are risk averse people. So the fact that they, I guess to an extent, it's, it's a bit like this, everybody to an extent understands property in the sense that you buy something for this, you spend this on it, and it's worth this. So that's a principle that we could explain to people that was enough for them to say, yes, this is something that I want to invest in. But again, we, it's not get rich quick, we've said it multiple times and it really isn't. So we work with them on a longer term basis mm. to where we can put their money into a deal, we can buy it, refurbish it, refinance out as much capital as we possibly can. You know, if there's investors that want to 
want to uh, mm. be cashed out at that point, that's fine. But otherwise, we'd actually like to run that money through a few deals. And that's that's what we look to do, work with people yeah. on a relationship basis. So start with that long term plan from day one. Absolutely. Right. A lot of a lot of people I see that try and maybe think about starting in property and then don't follow through are often the get rich quickers because they're thinking it's going to be so easy. And it's those that, and that's why I love the podcast and interviewing people who've actually walked the road is because the people that have done deals and stayed the course and continue to do it for three or four or five years will always say to you, you know, it's not easy, it takes hard work. It's about that long-term growth. Rob Moore, the co-founder of Progressive, said to me, you know, you've got to work hard enough to not have to work hard. And it's always burnt in my brain. So um, over the last sort of three, three and a bit years, what were the big challenges that maybe the days that you felt, oh, I'm going to quit this, I don't want to keep going, if there was those type of moments there? It's absolutely that, that you feel like you want to quit because I don't care what anybody says, it is hard. However, the difference between going to work and doing a nine to five and it being hard, you will have to do that for the rest of your life. Mm. You know, you're paying to your pension, but you retire at 60, 65, 70, whatever the, the state dictates at the time, I guess. Whereas the difference with this is you're working hard for a purpose. And as you said, you know, work hard enough now so that you don't have to work hard enough in the long run. So give me some examples of um, project challenges you've faced. Oh God, project challenges. Do you know what? There's, there's always going to be something, whether it's the solicitors taking forever in legals, like there's, there's one at the moment that's just caught us out. For example, this is, I, I do a, a series on uh, my YouTube, uh, YouTube channel, sorry, my Facebook where I call it F Up Fridays. And I always share some of the challenges because again, from the outside, I don't want it looking easy to people. I want them to know the bare bones mm. of it. So the one that we're going to be putting out this week is going to be F Up Friday in the sense that we're buying a property. Like I said, this is a commercial conversion. So this is new to us. We're going to be in commercial to residential six bed HMO. And it turns out that the extension of the property is actually built on the neighboring land. There's only a portion of it. It might be two meters squared, but there's two meters squared on somebody else's land. So it's things like this that you cannot plan for. As much you know, education, yeah. experience that you've got, there's things like this that will always catch you out. And that's, that's one of the ones that we're on with at the minute. And I think that's where it comes back to what you mentioned earlier about the mindset is the property knowledge education will give you the knowledge of how to source a deal and manage a refurb and get the finance. But it's the mindset and how you grow yourself mentally that prepares you for the piece of a house is built on someone else's land. So I guess, how much has your mindset changed, your confidence changed over the last sort of three and a half years? Completely, an absolute 180. I remember, like I said, we, we started off property education and in the, the education room, you know, I like to, I'm the sort of person that I'll be at the periphery. You might think I'd be in there, the, the, the grunt of the action, but I'm at the periphery and I'm listening into different people's conversations and I try and hang around with those people that are ahead of me, so to speak and just listening on those. And one of the things that just, the words that just kept coming to mind was mindset, mindset, mindset. So like I said, we took that first year to really educate, but what we were actually doing in that time is working on the mindset because even some of the small things like, okay, so in theory, I find a deal, somebody else is gonna fund it. But yeah, if you come from a background like us, we're two simple kids from council estate, if anything, being fully transparent, we probably had a poor money mindset. So therefore, to actually go from having a poor money mindset where, you know, speaking about money is something that you never do. It's a bad word, it's arrogant, it's all these things that you may have built it up to be in your mind, to being the person to where, look, not only am I going to go out and speak about it, I'm gonna go out and shout about it. So to answer your question, absolute 180, your mindset and education are, I guess, the two foundations upon which success will be built. Um. You mentioned as well about, um, like, you, I guess you could call it your why, uh, the, the, the reason why you do this. What, why, what's your big reason? What's your driver, the thing that gets you up in the morning? Well, there's a couple of things. We've got mine and Natalie's, respectively. Mine, I've almost lent on it a little bit there, that I didn't have a really bad childhood growing up or anything like that, but I guess to an extent, I, my, my possibilities were limited. And yes, they were limited by myself, but in some way, we want to be successful in all that we do to prove to other people from a similar background, similar class, similar colour, all these things, that it is possible for them to do something too because that's what we typically do. We look out to people that are similar to us and it gives us just enough of a spark to light the fire. So that's me personally and, and that certainly overlaps onto Natalie. However, hers is actually leaning more towards animals. One day we want to open up an animal rescue shelter 
And the thing is, that's going to be 25, 30 grand a month that we need coming in. And we want that to be supported by our portfolio. So that's, that's why we work so hard, those two things combined. A lot of people we talk to, um, they get into property to quit their job, become full time, or they don't get into property because they believe it's not possible unless they quit their job. So they go, I'd love to do property, but I've got a job, I can't. Um, you've been doing it three and a half years now correctly. Mm -hmm. You've built up a portfolio where you're onto your 10th deal. So have you quit your job? Has Natalie quit the, your, her job? Are you still working? Okay. Well, I guess it com comes down to your goals and your stretch goals. The stretch goals are obviously the, the animal sanctuary. That's a big one that we're working towards. But in the interim, we're, we're not quite at a stage where Natalie can comfortably leave her job because this is the thing. We, we're not going to do something that puts us in an uncomfortable situation. Mm. So na she's not at a point where she can comfortably quit yet. And what we actually chose to do at the beginning was it was a case of, right, what delegated roles and responsibilities are we going to take? it was discussed that I would take the driving seat within the business. So therefore, I would essentially lose revenue in the barber shop, and she would ultimately pick up that slack. So she's carried us financially in the first few years mm -hmm. to allow me to go out and work full time on this business. And that's how we chose to do it. Have you kept the barber shop though? Do you know what, surprisingly, I've actually kept the barber shop, and it's for several reasons. One, surprisingly, we actually get deals out of the shop. Mm -hmm. Two, naturally, we get investors out of the shop. And three, I absolutely love it. Doing this now, communication, speaking with people and just connecting sincerely, it's, it's just yeah. one of the things that really gives me energy. That's a really important point for people listening to this right now as well, is all of that, about the, the, what you enjoy, do what you enjoy, and you mentioned join it a bit, but you've got a barber shop on a, guess, a high street or a close to high street, and you've got customers. The customers are people. The people know people, and most of them either rent houses or own houses. So it's a source of leads. And if you're listening to this podcast right now, if you're watching this and you're thinking, oh my God, I'd own a kebab shop or I own a corner shop or whatever it may be. Why are you not using it to grow your property business for your marketing? So keeping it, great move. You've got staff then that run it while you do full-time property or do you still do the haircuts? Do you know what, I'm still in there a couple of, couple of days a week doing the haircuts and obviously COVID, it, people didn't go unscathed. We had a few few staff leave and things like that. So that's a, a transitional time. But yeah, I'm still in there doing a couple of days a week and enjoying it. Awesome. And so I guess the message for, for what would your message be to anybody who is thinking they'd love to do property, but they don't have time? Hmm. Well, I guess, first of all, assess whether you actually do have the time and can create the time because there's, there's people, and I've said it before, I'll say it again, there's people that invest with us because they see it as a viable option, a viable way to get a return on their money from something that they understand. So it is hard and know that there are different ways into it. You can actually leverage your position within property. However, if you have made the decision and you want to be on the front line, you want to be the person or persons within property, I guess it's like we said before you know consistency you have to show up and you know you mentioned it you, you phrased it the why you know find out that reason as cliche as it is to other people it's a bit woo woo it's in some of the some of the books and things like that motivational mindset books but find out what really drives you because as with anything it will be tough at times you know like i said at the minute we've got a property that's, that's built on somebody else's land that we want to buy it's going to be tough so you need to find that thing that stops you in those moments from quitting and that keeps you correct and keeps you coming back day after day after day, that knitted in with, do not think that it's it's get rich quick and it's gonna happen overnight. But what I will say is for me, or certainly my experience is, you will get rich slowly. You mm. do not get rich quick. Yeah. It's, it's guaranteed, but it takes yeah. time. What I often say to people is, I know that my kids will probably make more money out of my properties than I will because it's the generational wealth. It goes up and it'll go up in more money when in the future than it will today. But I'm still happy with the bit I get, but they'll make more. Um, but it's, not, it's about like the generational wealth and what you create for the future. So, and if you don't ever start, you don't ever get the opportunity to create that. Uh, in your property business, you've now got to the stage where you've got a couple of HMOs, you've got single lets, the, you, you've got the barber shop, your, your partner's working as well, so she's got a full-time job still. 
do you also, as well as find the deals and manage the refurbs, do you also manage the tenants or do you outsource that to agents? Absolutely not. So yeah, on day one, we decided, yes, we can make more money. However, we, we believe in leverage because it's difficult enough as it is, you don't need to add extra layers to it. So we don't manage the tenants. We've got a great local agent, in fact, two local agents, one that deals with the HMOs, one with the single lets, and we, and we leverage that, they're great at what they do, so allow them to do that. Okay, so key point here, two different agents, one for single lets, one for HMOs, why? Well, do you know what? We've, we started off a single let. We've got an absolutely amazing agent. Happy if anybody's in the area, you know, get in touch. I'll let you know who they are. Got an amazing agent. However, when it comes to doing the HMOs, they aren't as experienced. Don't get me wrong, they've got a handful. And it was, it was a bit of an awkward conversation to have with them to actually let them know that, look, as much as you manage the rest of our portfolio and you will continue to on the single let side, we're going to have to go down a different route. And that route was to go with a specialised HMO agent that does this day in, day mm -hmm. out, has all the systems in place, the WhatsApp groups for the tenants and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, that's the reason why we yeah. split that. Because quite often you see um, people give a HMO to a single let agent and then they struggle. They don't even have the right signage for advertising it. So really key bit of golden nugget there is make sure the agent matches the strategy. Uh, what would you say to anyone who's looking to maybe get started in property and they're thinking, um, you know, what would be the first steps? Should, where, where, what area should I invest in? How do I go look for the deals? Uh, give them a few sort of three, four points or pointers to get them going. Well, the first one we've already touched on it is mindset. Absolutely, mindset knitted in with education. Before you do anything, take time to work on that, you know, that space between your ears. They will take you further than anything. Then obviously off the back of that, it is about taking action because you learn so much through experience. But one of the things you can do is actually learn vicariously. So whether there's a mentor or there's you know, network meetings like you guys have here, whatever it is, surround yourself by the right people you know, that will get your temperature up, so to yeah. speak. So we've worked with a mentor for a couple of years now, and that's one of the things that we believe has massively accelerated us. So education, mindset, surround yourself with the right people. Do you know what? The, the, as I'm saying this, I realise that this is probably stuff that people have heard a million times, mm. but honestly, it is the basics. Do the basics, do them well, and do them consistently. Mm. Consistency is key, yeah. Um, the next 12 months, obviously your long-term goal is to inspire people who have come from different backgrounds, um, you know, council estates, etc. Um, and obviously Natalie's long-term goal around the you know, animal shelters and stuff, but what is your um, sort of next 12 month goal. Where are you looking to get to by the say the end of 2023? Next 12 months. Do you know what we like I said we've got a cautious approach and we very much do believe in more of the same. If you found something that works, cookie cutter, rinse and repeat. The same way our single lets they look identical. The same way our HMOs they're a really nice spec, really nice standard, but they look identical. And there's a reason for that. If you find something that works, continue to do it. So we'll do more of the same only, like I said, we're leaning now more into commercial conversions and you know potentially looking for blocks of flats and things like that. And coupled with that, we want to continue to do what we've always done, which is work with other people's money. However, we'd quite like to start working with some larger pots of cash and fully fund some of these deals, some of these bigger deals. Now, what about the person that says, ain't that a bit boring doing more of the same? Um, what do you say about the, the cookie cutter, more of the same approach? Is it boring or is it sexy? Well, I'd actually ask them to look at Warren Buffett. Look at Warren Buffett, one of the, I don't know how you want to phrase him, you know, some people might say he's a lazy investor, but he's found something that works, found his margin, found his point of value, and he continues to do the same. And he ultimately allows the compounding to do the work for him. And that's the thing. Yes, property might fluctuate you know, in the meantime, but in the long run, the trajectory is up. So we're going to continue to ride that wave. What about the current market? So there's a lot of people out there at the moment maybe thinking, oh, is the property market going to crash? Are interest rates going to go through the roof? Um, what's your feelings on the, on the market at the moment? Are you going to stop and try and time the market? Or are you just carrying on as you were? What are you up to? That's a great question. The word you used there was feeling. What is your feeling? Mm. Whereas typically, I know you probably did that on purpose, but we actually try and leave feelings and emotions out of it, leave them all together out of the decision making process. The, you know, we look at the fundamentals of property, some, some of the pillars supply, demand, liquidity of finance. As long as those things are in place, 
property will continue, especially with housing shortage and all the other stuff that we can knit in, it will continue to be relevant. So therefore we'll continue to do exactly what we've always done, which is buy carefully, buy intelligently. And it's that simple, but not easy, simple philosophy that you find something that you can either buy value, obviously everybody loves a discount. Mm. If we can get a discount, great. But if not, find something where you can add value. And that's where you know the single lets that we've done, we've always found something that's a one bed into a two bed, a two bed into a three, a two into a three plus an ensuite, or uh, sorry, not the commercial conversion, the, that's the next one we're doing, the um, HMOs. You know, How can you find a way to add value? So we're gonna continue to do exactly what we've been doing and find a way to add value to mitigate any potential fluctuations in the market. So really great point there of keep feelings out of it, look at the fundamentals. Um, single lets continuing to do, HMOs coming to continue to do the commercial. You've gone for commercial to HMO. Um, it's a six bed HMO. What about when people talk about utility costs right now? Are you worried about the utility costs? Are you doing anything in that conversion to mitigate the cost of utilities as much as possible? Oh, do you know what? I guess to a certain extent, there's only so much you can do. However, one of the great things about HMOs is actually the cash flow on them. They, they yield a lot more, so therefore, you can actually you know, absorb some of that. Not only that, but we've already seen it in our area. You've probably seen it in your area. The rents are creeping up. So therefore, yes, the utilities have probably you know, crept up maybe a tiny bit more, but so far we've seen, we've seen mm. none, if, if not minimal impacts. And then I guess just on that, the, you mentioned uh, commercial, just to sort of put in there for people, anybody that's listening, the reason why we've gone for commercial is yes, we're still looking for our residential stock, but the commercial stock is usually, or we found it, Price, more price competitive, yep. usually price a little bit cheaper, so to speak, overall, you know, pound per square foot or however you want to assess it. So therefore that's, a, you know, maybe another thing for people to consider, you know, start looking for commercial stuff. Yes, everybody's finding it a little bit more challenging to find the residential stuff. Can you find something that's commercial in nature? Because the thing is, the one way of buying, if you, if you took off the signs that says it's a business, it looks like a house. Yep. It's just a big house. So it's a big house with a more competitive price point. You just have to go through the process of actually doing the planning. Really good point. So small house, commercial is just a bigger house. Um, and it is fundamentally bricks and mortar. So people are gonna live there and rather than having one family in there, you're gonna have six families in there or six individuals in there, six tenancies. So, but that point on higher cash flow, what would a single let that you're doing in your area cash flow you and what would the HMO cash flow you? Uh, anything on a single let could be sort of 150, 250, 300, somewhere around there de dependent. And the HMOs, after all costs, you know, a thousand pound a month, mm. something like that. So if utilities go up 300 quid, you're still making 700? Yeah, absolutely. So still a better deal. Yeah. Awesome. So really appreciate you coming in, Stephen, sharing that content with us, telling us a little bit about your journey. If anybody wants to follow you, reach out, meet you, um, see what you're up to on your journey, how could they contact you? Well, they can always search for our company, which is Grey Fern Properties. We're on Grey Fern Properties on all, all social media platforms. But what I would say is property and business is about people. We don't hide behind a brand or a logo. Search Stephen Kemp on Facebook. That's where I spend most of my time. Drop me a DM. Awesome. So you've been listening to the Progressive Property Podcast. I've been Kevin McDonald. He's been Stephen Kemp. Make sure that you subscribe to the podcast and the Progressive Property Facebook community for more content on all things property. And I'll see you next week.